Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen. When Angelina Jolie told the world that she'd had a DNA test and had decided to have her breasts removed, we were all shocked. But I suspect very few people asked, what's a DNA test? Everyone knew about DNA. Thanks, of course, to two famous people, O.J. Simpson and Monica Lewinsky. Um, <laughs> It's easy to forget that before that popularization, uh, this was very much the reserve of the medical elite and academics. And if we go back to 60 years ago, there was very little penetration of that iconic discovery. Indeed, 60 years ago, my mother was mainly distressed by the fact that our, new found, uh, our new bought, newly bought television didn't work when she was trying to watch the coronation because the lady next door had an unsuppressed vacuum cleaner we later discovered. And I was deeply distressed by the fact that my mother had withdrawn breast milk uh, and I in fact apparently spent several months subsequently trying to gain access to her bra without success. <laughs> A behaviour pattern which re-emerged about 15 years later with equal lack of success for many years. <laughs> This is um, a great honour and pleasure to be here back in, in UNESCO. This is my third visit to this room and in fact this time last year uh, I was sitting here, not falling asleep but reading that monitor, uh, when Professor Lee, who is here in, in the front row, uh, was presenting uh, the uh, endorsement of the uh, Human Varium Project by the Chinese government, a very important step uh, and pledging their support to this really very important exercise and what I'm going to do in the next 20 minutes with your permission is to speak a little bit about the Human Varium Project and why I think it is an important project, one that we should all endorse and support despite the challenge that it, it offers us. Uh, and I'll use three or four clinical examples which for the experts in the audience are very familiar but I hope you will forgive me uh, using them. I actually became a geneticist I think 45 years ago. Uh, I was a biology student, rather bored, got taken to a lecture by a geneticist who explained the genetic code. What captivated me was its simplicity, and the lecturer told me a little bit more about it over coffee at the end, but what really captivated me was that my biology teacher didn't understand it and asked me to explain it to him on the way back to school on the bus. Uh, and that, that memory stuck with me. And when I went to medicine and discovered that there was no genetics in medicine, I decided to take a year out and, and study it uh, and... Uh, acquire a degree in genetics and that set the course of my career. Um, what I learned back then 45 years ago was that in fact uh, it is a degenerate code and it is in fact very much that, that which provides the basis for uh, our challenge because in fact if you take your four letters and combine them in sets of three when looking at the RNA rather than the DNA you get a U instead of a T uh, the, the, the situation is you can actually create 64 different combinations of those four letters in sets of three, but we only need 20 of them and a few uh, full stops. So basically, if you take, for example, the, the code CCG, then you get proline. But in fact, if you take CC anything, you get proline. And so we have a problem immediately that when we look at the sequence of the DNA, uh, we could get lots of different uh, codes for the same amino acid. What was really quite striking as we began to understand genetics was um, that really quite simple changes could have a profound effect. This little girl from West Africa um, has sickle cell disease and she has a swollen forehead because her bone marrow has hugely expanded to try and replace the constant breakdown of her blood. These are her red cells, not the usual donut shaped, but the, they've gone a sickle shape because the haemoglobin molecules are all sticking together bursting the cells, causing extreme pain, loss of circulation, anemia, and generally a very early death unless uh, given intensive treatment. It's an interesting example of what we now realize to be a common issue, that in fact we are evolved, we have, our genes have been selected, and this particular gene proves to be a great advantage if you are a carrier of it, if you inherit it from one parent, your chance of dying of cerebral malaria uh, is dramatically reduced, as a result of which, in the Rift Valley area, up to one in three people carry this gene. Obviously, when they marry and have a child who gets two copies, that child manifests this disease and probably dies. But that is offset by the number of them who don't die of malaria, which is, I recently discovered has killed probably 10% of all humans who ever lived. Uh, and so that selective force has driven up the frequency of this gene. 
Back when I was studying genetics and before Professor Arbour and his colleagues had solved our problems for us in terms of analysing DNA, we'd already worked out what the spelling mistake was in this gene uh, by simple deduction from the protein. Clearly what had happened was there'd been a single letter change that had changed the glutamine to a valine, a, very, a glutamic acid sorry, to a valine, a very simple change which meant that in low oxygen tension your haemoglobin molecules stick together causing this dreadful disease. It's really worth remembering, even for those of us who do this for a living, how our entire life can be devastated by a single letter change out of those billions of letters in our genome. And you realize immediately the challenge that we face in finding those single letter changes that can be so life transforming uh, and how we need to pool our knowledge in order to be able to achieve that. So sequencing began with uh, Sanger, who invented this very simple, rather elaborate and, uh, challenge uh, in the old days of sequencing DNA, a chain terminating technique, the Sanger method, still generally the, the, the workhorse of our technology. Uh, in the old days, we used X-ray plates, which meant we were all carrying around big sheets of X-ray film uh, to see where the, the, the fragments stopped in each of those four columns to tell you where the A's, C's, G's and T's were. Later, that get, was given a fluorescent tag. And then, of course, the ABI sequences came along, which could read those fluorescent tags simultaneously. And so the Human Genome Project, of which we're all familiar, had surried ranks of these machines. And if you went to the Sanger Center, where uh, about a quarter of this work was done, there was a, a huge factory, uh, hundreds of people generating sequence using these machines. That same army of people could now be replicated by one technician with one machine. Uh, and uh, that means that we can now sequence DNA at a scale that even the most imaginative of us, I think, could not have foreseen uh, a decade back. Craig Venter and Jim Watson both had their genome sequenced in the mid-2000s. Followed the third, in fact, person to be sequenced was a, a colleague, a clinical geneticist in the Leiden Centre, uh, Myelin Creek, who volunteered to have her genome sequenced by Johan Den Dunnen, who is one of our key uh, leaders in the Human Variome Project. And that cost uh, about 40,000 euros. Had it been done uh, in 2000, it would have cost about 100 million euros. Euros. So that was the profound collapse in cost. Interestingly, our American colleagues were deeply unimpressed by this achievement, pointing out that it had already been done twice before. The Australian media captured the moment, however, when they said that man takes one step towards understanding woman. Uh, <laughs> having been married 40 years, I can tell you it's a very small step indeed. So what we're actually seeing there was the first beginnings of a true revolution in our laboratory technologies. Moore described, Gordon Moore described Moore's law uh, for, for computing how every, uh, was it six months or two years, rather, our computers would double in their transistor power and density. And, and sequencing costs were falling much in line with that uh, Moore's law for computing until the advent of next generation sequencing when in 2007 the price just collapsed. Uh, and we're now down, I'm, I'm going to have my whole genome sequenced as a training exercise in September, and it will cost about £5,000. And it's confidently predicted that just using our existing technologies and some newer ones coming down the track, like Ion Torrent and, and Oxford Nanopore, we can probably get that down to about £1,000. And I'm working in a small biotech company who is competing with the world to think of an even better way of doing it, using nanowires, we call it last generation sequencing, modestly, uh, and we think we can actually sequence chromosomes without breaking them. And so people genuinely believe that one of these technologies will take us to giving us the whole genome for maybe $100. Now, of course, it isn't a genome we can use in the clinic because it's got spelling mistakes, its density of coverage isn't certain, but nevertheless, it demonstrates the enormous expansion of our capacity. So the first of the examples that I want to draw to your attention. I, I was sitting in the early hours of this morning thinking I'd like to put a couple of clinical examples in and this is one that I quite like uh, because back in the 17th century uh, uh, Gerrit uh, Jans and his 13 year old wife, it was legal then, um, arrived in South Africa in Pretoria and uh, set up home uh, quite near there uh, and started having children. And I was there only 10 days ago this, so this one was stuck in my mind. And what was interesting was that uh, in uh, the 1960s, a Dr. Dean was looking after a nurse in South Africa who died unexpectedly when he gave her a barbiturate anaesthetic. And she had this unusual problem, what's called porphyria variegata. 
Porphyrins are the things you use in making the heme in your hemoglobin. Uh, and people with porphyrias can't metabolize those porphyrins correctly uh, and they become light sensitive. Their skin burns in the sun. And so it turned out that this nurse who died had that condition. And then another member of this same extended family died as well. And Dr. Dean wrote an iconic uh, MD where he studied this huge pedigree. It turned out that 10,000 people descended from that couple had inherited that spelling change which gave them this initially fairly trivial condition of burning skin when you get in the sunlight until they were exposed to the new challenge of barbiturate anesthetics when their much more life-threatening pharmacogenetic problem emerged. Now it's a good example because this is a classic founder effect. You don't need to inherit this from both parents, just from one parent. That will give you the chemical toxins in your skin, the abnormal porphyrins that lead to the problem. Uh, and this so-called autosomal dominant trait has become very common in South Africa. And we see this all over the world. So clearly, uh, when we begin to understand the human variome in all its, its dimensions, we can't simply sit in one place and look at the people who live in our street. This has to be a global effort in order to fully understand this variation. And of course, most of that variation is in Africa because we left collectively quite recently and so we're all quite closely related. And in some areas in Central Africa, the difference between villages is greater than the difference between the Chinese and the English. Uh, and so that's a hugely important part of this exercise. So this is Jim Watson. Uh, Jim is a friend and a patron of our Centre for Life in Newcastle, where we, as you heard, are involved in genetic education. And in fact, we have 40,000 school children going through our institute doing practical genetics and, two and a half, 250,000 people coming to our visitor centre to see the science exhibits. And in fact, this September, one of the children who went through our centre has just completed her PhD in genetics and is about to start in medicine and wants to be a clinical geneticist, so I have finally replaced myself. Um, <laughs> Jim came, along with Francis Crick, apparently we're the only project they ever co-sponsored, uh, to be our patrons. Uh, and, and this is Jim outside our department a few years ago. Um, interestingly, he I had his whole genome sequenced um, and is perfectly fit. Um, he has a habit of saying strange things to journalists, but we don't think it's genetic. We can't actually find the explanation for it. Um, this, however, is his genome, and, and the team in Baylor assembled it, and it illustrates the challenge that we face. The missense changes, these are simple changes of amino, amino acids, like the one I showed you in sickle cell. 8,967 of them. And then 2,421 we'd never heard of before. And the list goes on. Spelling nonsense that stopped the gene, etc. Synonymous changes that just don't apparently change the amino acid, but might change the way the gene works, and so on. And then when you get out into the areas around the gene, you find thousands more of these spelling variations. It's estimated we have about 3 million each, of which perhaps 400 are ma of major relevance to our health. And one or two, like sickle cell trait, if you get them from both parents, could give you a dreadful disease. So we've got to sort this out, and that's where the Human Variome Project comes in. Returning to Holland, um, if you go to Amsterdam Station now, you see that we have a problem. We have a traffic jam with bicycles in Holland. That's nothing, however, if you go to Professor Lee's hometown uh, and look at the traffic jams in China. China currently holds the record for the longest traffic jam, I understand, although I think Moscow is trying to challenge. But this was in 2010. They had a 100-kilometer-long, 11-day gridlock on one road. They had to set up a whole sort of series of villages to feed the people who were stuck on this road. This might look impressive, but it is nothing compared to the gridlock we are heading into now, as people like Yoris there to churn out vast numbers of exomes and genomes into our clinical databases. We have got to pool our resources to solve this problem. My, another, uh, my third or second or third example is a condition in which I've had a long-standing uh, interest uh, to illustrate the practicalities of the Human Variable Project. This is a family with hereditary cancer that I was working on about 20 years ago uh, when I was approached by a yeast geneticist, or we were approached by a yeast geneticist, to ask if he could have some DNA. He had an idea what might be going on because families like this, their tumours pick up extra spelling mistakes. And Richard Colodner's team actually took DNA from Ted, a local shepherd, who had had three colon cancers and nine skin cancers, uh, and his sister Bertha, who had endometrial cancer, and demonstrated that they had a spelling mistake 
in the gene that corrects spelling mistakes, the mismatch repair genes. It transpires that yeast and indeed E. coli use essentially the same genes to repair their DNA. So that by taking the uh, DNA from Ted, he was able to actually identify the, using the yeast equivalent of those genes, his copy of those genes and find the spelling mistake that caused his cancer. It's an interesting thing to reflect on philosophically for a moment that in fact when you're sitting here uh, uh, or if you're sitting in a pub drinking a glass of beer there's a yeast cell somewhere down in the glass actually fixing its DNA with the same genes that you fix yours. If you've got no one else to talk to you can reflect on that. It's a sort of a Buddhist moment. <laughs> the importance of this uh, was that that this gave us an access to a whole new class of disorders that we could actually start to predict which members of these families would get cancer and which would not and actually intervene and indeed uh, with Professor Finn McCrane who's in the front row uh, and colleagues around the world we've recently demonstrated that simply giving aspirin to these patients can half their cancer rate and we're about to start a new trial to see whether we can achieve that with low dose aspirin. So this is really very important to be able to identify these people and bring them in for surveillance, surgery and medical intervention. Now this is a family that came into my clinic three years ago just before I came to speak in this room for the first time when UNESCO became uh, a partner of the Human Variome Project. The lady at the top had microsatellite unstable cancer, she had a mutation in her MLH1 gene and I was told this was a variant of uncertain significance by our laboratory. My problem was that the lady in the white coat on your left uh, is the one there who did not have that spelling mistake. The good news was she had not inherited it. The bad news was I didn't know whether that was the cause of the problem because it was a variant of uncertain significance. This amino acid change had never been seen before so no one knew whether it made a difference or not. Therefore, I couldn't act on it. This lady and her children faced two yearly colonoscopy and other rec regular medical checks because I couldn't be sure that they were not at risk. Fortunately, sitting just over there next to Rolf Simons I and, and Robert Hofstra, I was able to ask them, I said, have you seen this? They said, oh yeah, we've been to do some work on that. In fact, we're pretty sure uh, that it is a, uh, a pathological variant because it affects the, uh, the, the protein expression uh, and it doesn't interact properly. And although our computer programs were uncertain, at least one of them said that it was significant and indeed it had been reported in the literature pr subsequent to my colleagues actually doing the analysis on the first patient. So I was able to go back and say to this family, I have good news. I am now convinced that that spelling mistake did cause your mother's cancer. Therefore, I am now confident that you are not at increased risk of cancer and therefore I do not need to give you two yearly colonoscopies. So you can see the, the powerful impact of that shared knowledge. And this is a slide from Dick Cotton's collection that he was showing in a recent uh, lecture uh, from our Insight Committee where these are all laboratories doing different analyses of particular mutations, this particular mutation in the MLH1 gene. Some of them think it's pathogenic, some of them think probably not, depending on which technique you use to do the analysis. And so we have an international committee that gets together, converses on these topics, looks at this data and then decides whether to put it into our database as a pathogenic variant or not. That is a hugely valuable contribution to the world literature and it means that whether you're a public laboratory or a private laboratory, you can now go to the Insight database, look at that spelling change and counsel families and give them the benefit of that shared knowledge. It makes obvious sense that we should do this. The Insight team derives its name from the International Society for Gastrointestinal Hereditary Tumours, uh, which actually had its first meeting, combined meeting in Newcastle in 2005 and Finn now uh, is its General Secretary. And we brought together in this little group here in Newcastle outside our centre all of the people who were running databases of the mismatch repair genes. Because there was one in Holland, there was one in Newfoundland, there was one in Finland, there was a bit in Australia. Everyone was doing their own thing. And we simply said, why don't we all get together and do one thing? And we'll call it the Insight Database. And so, in fact, this is the model system for the local specific databases of the, the Human Variome Project. And our plan is that we will have expert groups like this with their own special interest looking at each family of genes or even individual genes and then sharing that knowledge with the rest of us. And so some, some achievements. The Insight database uh, now has 12,500 variants in the four genes uh, and we get 20,000 hits per month. 
So you can imagine the impact that's having across the world of people who are trying to actually counsel families like the one that I've shown you. And one of the problems, of course, is when you try and set up these databases, it's not always easy. Sometimes people who devoted their entire lives to collecting this data together can be a little precious, and they don't like to give it away. And so they have to be persuaded. And one of our tasks is to actually persuade our colleagues to pool their knowledge because we are better together than apart. And in fact, one of the exercises that we undertook, uh, and there's Dick at the very back there on the right-hand side, um, was to bring together a lot of opinion forms from around the world to actually get them to agree that we could uh, collaboratively curate the varium, as we put it. Uh, and in the front there, a very interesting character, Buck Strom from the States, who is actually the head uh, geneticist at Quest Laboratories, one of the huge private laboratories in the States. We hear a lot about Myriad hanging onto their data, but Quest have donated their data to the system. They can see the benefit of this. If you do this for a living, the faster you can issue a report, the more money you make. So you don't have to be altruistic. This, can, this makes good commercial sense as well. I'd like to give you one other nice example of the challenge that we face. Um, so I, uh, if you were to have gone back 500 generations in my family, I would have not shown great interest in my mother's breast milk at the age of a year because it would upset my tummy. Because I would have not had the ability to drink milk. Um, we used to have a condition called hereditary lactose intolerance, which, because white people write textbooks and everybody else in the world couldn't drink milk. So we said that they had this genetic problem called lactose intolerance. So someone said, actually, there's more of them than there are of us. So we changed the name to hereditary persistence of lact intestinal lactase. We have the problem or the variation on the normal human trait, which is that once you've finished your breast milk, you should stop breastfeeding so the next baby can have the breast milk. And then about 7,000 years ago, Europeans, or about 7,000 BC, Europeans acquired this strange trait that we stopped switching off our lactase so we could carry on drinking milk all through our lives. And of course that ran hand in glove with the dairy industry and with our migration across Europe and proved a very advantageous trait. You could feed without eating the cow, you could just drink its milk, a clear advantage, and the cow could walk with you to the next eating place. So basically, this was a useful advantage, which came first, the dairy industry or the gene, you can choose for yourself. But it was interesting that our Finnish colleagues a few years ago looked at this trait and they found that there was nothing different about the lactase gene in, human, in, in white people compared to black people or Chinese people or whatever. The only difference they could find was a single letter change, 13,000 or so bases upstream, a single C to T change. And it, they got that published and we all thought, whoa, that's not very impressive. But if they say that's what it is, that must be what it is. Now, then a very interesting paper came out uh, in 2007 where the team went to Africa and they found three other tribes, marginally less successful than the Europeans, uh, who had actually lived in, the, in Kenya, in Tanzania and Sudan, who were also pastoralists. They could also drink milk as adults. And they looked at their genes, fully expecting them to be our, our distant relatives, but surprisingly they weren't. They all had a spelling difference. And it was all very close to the last one, but it wasn't the same. The letters are along the bottom there, the C, G, T and G, were all in exactly the same position in the middle of another gene, 13,000 bases upstream. And when they took that little piece of DNA and stuck it into a cell in a laboratory, it turned out to be the on-off switch for lactase. So what had happened here was that four times at least, in fact at least five times in history, a mutation has hit the on-off switch for lactase, giving a population the ability to drink milk and therefore changing their behaviour pattern. Now you can imagine how challenging that would have been to find if we didn't have the very easy phenotype that people can or cannot drink milk. We now know that there are literally thousands of non-coding RNAs in between the 20,000 genes that are like the fingers on the strings of the violin controlling the expression of our genes. There are promoters, there are suppressors, there are all sorts of mechanistic differences between the genes that we have to understand if we are truly to understand disease. And that's before we even begin to think about how genes interact. My height, for example, is probably determined by 600 different genes all interacting with different spelling changes in them. Added to which, whether or not I was breastfed or not, changes the methylation or chemical treatment of my DNA and also affects my growth. If my mother had been badly fed in pregnancy, that would have made me smaller. So there's a huge amount to learn and we cannot, simply cannot do it unless we do it together. This is a big problem. This is a stone elephant from India. 
you will hear all sorts of new organizations coming along. Uh, the latest is the Global Alliance, to which you and Very Own Project is a founder member and signatory. And the Global Alliance, I hope, is the beginning of a major upsurge across the world of investment in this field. Uh, but I don't think this is a replacement for the Human Very Own Project. It's an enhancement of the brilliant concept that Dick Cotton gave us. So just a few more final achievements. The LOVD installations now contain 520,000 plus variants in 162,000 individuals. So when, as I met last week, a hospital lead who said, our hospital doesn't think it's ethical to share this data, uh, and we don't think we're allowed to. Well, I know 162,000 people who disagree. I think we have to face this down. The only way we can collectively solve this problem is if we, in a secure and anonymous way, share this knowledge with each other. Um, these are just the views. You can read the numbers. These are very impressive numbers. So when people say, what have the Romans ever done for us? Uh, what, has Elo what has the Human Varion Project ever done? Well, it's done a lot. It's only a beginning, but it's done the right things, and it's, bu it's building on that. We've got colleagues all over the world becoming involved. The idea is, and, and you have to have a, a foothold in each country, the ethical cultural, legal structure of every society is different. You cannot generalize how you will handle this information. Uh, and this is particularly true of things like we heard from America where they are going to pass on information about people's unsolicited findings, whether or not they're at risk of high penetrance diseases. We in Europe think that's unwise, but we have a different healthcare system and a different legal system and we can get away with withholding it. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is our picture from last year. Um, the Human Variant Project is very much alive and kicking. It is, I think, going to go from strength to strength and with the support already of the Chinese government and, I hope, of British, European, American, Australian, the rest of the world, uh, we will go from strength to strength and really begin to solve this problem. So, in summary, sequencing will soon cease to impress. It is not the problem. The problem is analysing the data. Our ability to intervene will drive this process. People need to know. Angelina Jolie has done us a great service in that, in that regard. We have a responsibility to integrate, and the UNESCO is perfectly placed to facilitate that. And we should never lose sight of the fact that failure to share this knowledge kills people. Thank you for your attention.